That's a gift. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Welcome to our listening session for General Conference 2012. It's a joy to see those of you who are able to be present with us here this morning, and we're glad that you managed to figure out how to get here around the marathon runners. So, well done. Well done, yes. I would like to introduce who we have sitting up front this morning, just in case you don't know all of us. I am Harriet Bryan and a clergy delegate Jim Allen is a lay delegate, Connie Clark, lay delegate, Lynn Hill, clergy delegate, and Don Ladd, lay delegate. So we will be listening, taking notes, and answering questions as our time permits this morning. As you might expect when the body of Christ, members of the body of Christ are gathered, I'd like for us to open with a prayer. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for your call upon our lives and the trust that you place in us to be your people. We know that our book of discipline tells us that our task is to convince the world of the reality of the gospel of Jesus Christ or to leave it forever unconvinced. And we pray that as we listen as we deliberate and as general conference meets, that we would be open to the leading of your Holy Spirit, that we might indeed be faithful disciples who make disciples and who transform the world. Amen. Amen. Our purpose today is to hear comments that you have to make and to attempt to address questions as they are posed to us in the interest of time we're going to try to limit each comment to two minutes. I don't think that I need to say this, but when I went to the pre-general conference briefing, they stressed over and over that as the body of Christ, we don't want to imitate the world. So we speak the truth in love, we don't engage in name calling, and we're not going to have our time together to be a time to air grievances. I don't think I needed to say that, but just in case, I thought I would set the stage. There are a number of major issues coming before General Conference next month, and I'm not going to speak to each of them, but want to give a really quick overview even as I embarrass my colleague, clergy delegate Stephen Handy, who's come forward to join us. He called me out once many years ago, so I'm returning the favor. <laughs> A lot has been written and said about restructuring for the general church and what that would look like. We have the call to action proposal, the Methodist Federation for Social, Social Action has presented an alternative proposal, and in recent days, the alternative proposal Plan B, UMC Plan B, has come forward. So we may delve into that a little more deeply. We're very fortunate to have Don Ladd with us today, who is uniquely equipped to respond to some of those questions that you might have. There is a constitutional amendment that is coming before us to allow the General Conference to empower other church units to distribute funds in between sessions of General Conference. That's part of the call to action report. Under the worldwide nature of the church, we will be asked to create a global book of discipline that specifies what decisions the General Conference makes and which areas of ministry and organization are adaptable by the Central Conferences. For the first time, the General Conference on Finance and Administration is presenting a church budget that is a reduction from previous years, 6.6 percent lower at six hundred and three million dollars and again we are very blessed to have someone in our conference who serves 
on the General Conference on Finance Administration's board. So any questions there will go to Lynn Hill. <laughs> there are proposed two proposed changes for clergy pensions that would shift more of the risk and retirement preparation from annual conferences to individual clergy. And this would cut cost to conferences by about 15%. So those of us who are clergy are probably more interested in that than others. The ministry study is proposing doing away with the security of guaranteed appointments, streamlining the candidacy process, and allowing ordination when educational requirements are completed. I've received mail recently concerning divestment petitions in Israel-Palestine, and then there are always um, questions surrounding what the church's position should be regarding human sexuality, and there are um, petitions to retain the current language that says, specifically addressing homosexuality, that it's incompatible with Christian teaching, and there are petitions to say we want to strike that language, and we would rather say that people of deep faith disagree on this matter. So a lot that you might wish to address this morning. But that's a very brief and quick overview. Of course. Oh, you have to go to the microphone. I'm sorry. Stephen, please. Go to the microphone so we have that. Hi. Um, <laughs> your, uh, I happily was uh, passed a, a overview of the plan A and B, or A, I guess, is connectional table. And That's the B, call to B action, is right? The, plan B okay. is the. And then you mentioned MFSA had, a, is that a th compar third and competing plan? Yes. Or? Yes, okay. it is. The issue is, I understand. Stand it, and, and the question, because I'm supposed to repeat the question, is about comp competing plans for church structure. That Call to Action has one, and MFSA, Methodist Federation for Social Action, has another, and then there is a third for Plan B as it's being built. And as I understand it, the concern with the latter two has to do with representation, that there's too great of a loss of diversity. Um, with the original plan, which would shrink 500 people to 60. So. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm Jacqueline Sojourner, retired clergy, and I came to see the delegation today because I'm going to Tampa as a marshal, so I will be there to help you find your sections, etc. cetera, uh, and am taking an oath of neutrality at that point. Um, so I'm going to, to today emphasize an area that I'm deeply concerned about and that is the 56 years of history of the guaranteed appointment, the inclusivity that that has brought to our church, both ethnic, ethnically and in gender uh, matters, especially regarding elder ordination. And as we go more global within the church, uh, my sisters in Asia and Africa need that kind of uh, support more than even the rest of us. So I would urge, having served on the Board of Ordained Ministry for eight years, that we can do many ways of evaluation um, short of doing away with guaranteed appointment and that some of this is the role of the Board of Ordained Ministry rather than the Council of Bishops or other entities within the church. But if any of you are serving on that subcommittee in particular, 
I would hope that we really take a very careful look at that before we do such a step. Thank you. Jackie, mm -hmm. before you sit down. <laughs> and all of us, I'm sure, will get a chance to address that either in the committee or in the plenary. Um, obviously, it's something you've thought about, so I want to pick your brain a all little right. bit. Um, guaranteed appointment is, of course, shorthand for guaranteed appointment for elders in full connection. Right. There's no guaranteed appointment for deacons. There's no guaranteed appointment for local pastors. And most importantly to me, there's no guaranteed jobs for lay people who work for the annual conference. That, that's a joke. But well, uh, is a, <laughs> I, I'd be interested, I mean, in, in your readings and thought and whatever, how do we distinguish between we need to guarantee elders an appointment but not deacons and local pastors? Well, a lot of us have had formulas over the, let's see, I started going to annual conference when I was 15 years old. So I have um, several decades of, of conferences in two jurisdictions. So um, I would agree, you know, I fought for the lay vote at annual conference. I fought for the equalization amendment when I was a diaconal that got the vote for diaconal ministers and has broadened the lay participation at annual conference by balancing the clergy with the number of laity to bring those numbers up to the same number every year. And uh, I have seen uh, a lot of those changes evolve. Would you clarify the rest of your question? If you ignore my lead up, I mean, the real question is, what's different about guaranteed appointment for elders and not guaranteeing appointments for deacons or local, especially Well, one local article pastors? I read recently talked about itinerancy and, and the willingness to go where you're sent. And I think it, only, only uh, those of us under Episcopal appointment are faced with that. And having been the first woman in 12 churches in this annual conference, I'm here to tell you that would not have happened without that stance. Would we have 22 female bishops now if we had not had that stance? Would we have had, um, I've had a Korean DS, I've had three black bishops, I've had um, one woman DS. I've, I've known uh, of that change. I just don't believe, and, and we have seen through history that when we let up on these areas, uh, we regress. And so I'm proud of the church having taken that stance and Georgia Harkness always comes to mind when I think of this legislation and uh, she would roll over in her grave if we rescinded. Jackie, okay. thank you very much. Before you leave, one of the interesting perspectives that I see in terms of this question about guaranteed appointments is around ineffectiveness. Yes, and, and that and, needs to be addressed. And so my question yeah. is, if, if we believe we already have the structure, the infrastructure, the processes and procedures in place, and it's not happening, should there be an alternative? And if there should be an alternative... Well, the bishops what, have an alternative. Yeah, but they just but, have not been using so, it. So <laughs> that's, my, that's, my, that's my point. We, we have everything in place, supposedly but yet we have a large amount, whether we want to be truthful about the issue or not, is a great deal of ineffectiveness in our denomination at all levels. Let me just say that at all levels. In particular, in our, our clergy pool. But we've allowed that to happen so long. Now we're saying let's take a look at it. And the question is not that we shouldn't, but we should have been taking a look at it some time ago. What do you think is an alternative if the alternatives are not working? Well, uh, I attended two annual conferences last year, believe it or not. As a retired clergy, I've gone to more instead of fewer. Uh, 
I, I went to Greater New Jersey's, uh, my home conference. We had not been back in 20 years. Price still has a vote there, so he voted for the delegations from that conference. And uh, they have a model there that we might look at. I believe through all of the uh, annual conferences, there are many models. Ours was thrown out at least the one four years ago by the Judicial Council. That's not to say it can't be perfected in other ways. And those of you that have been DSs know that um, effectiveness and evaluation take place all the way along the line. Let me speak to the second ministry item uh, while I'm at it, uh, and that is I would not shorten the process toward ordination. Some of these uh, safeguards are indeed in the lengthening of the process that we have uh, implemented over, what, the last two or three quadrennium. And the training that we have given those folks in particular while they are on probation, I believe, will help this greatly. So I, if I were ever to have been elected a delegate, I would vote down uh, the streamlining of the process, and I would keep the historic uh, um, inclusivity of the guaranteed appointment. But every DS and every bishop has ways of dealing with effectiveness, as do, uh, I believe, in peer and the covenanting uh, that we have also been working on. I've served on that uh, orders committee for, I think, three quadrennium. Uh, there are things we're doing and more that perhaps we need to look at. But to just say, well, we've done that for 55 years, now it's time to stop it, is to, um, in fact, do harm instead of our enjoiner of first do no harm. Thank you. Thank you, Jackie. I know our three-minute limit just went to 15 minutes. But that's a chance you take when you ask the first question is, is we took the chance to ask you. Hello, I have my cell phone, um, not because I'm technologically savvy, which I'm not, but it has a stopwatch just to <laughs> honor the two minutes. Um, I'm a trainer, and so I actually do really stick to time. Um, not too much of a preacher just yet. Um, so I'm Laura Rospert. Um, I'm a member at Dalewood United Methodist Church, where my husband serves as the pastor. I'm also a student at Vanderbilt Divinity School, and I'm also in the ordination process as a deacon, as a certified candidate. Just got approved to enter the commissioning process and write lots of papers over the next year. Um, and I wanted to come talk to you about an issue of pastoral care for me. Um, and I will try not to cry, but I often do, because. I carry the stories of a lot of people with me in my heart. Um, I am somebody who believes that our church should be inclusive, and I believe that God creates all of God's children in God's image and loves them for who they were created to be. And I hear a lot of problems in our church because a lot of people come and talk to me behind closed doors. I have moms and dads who are parents of gay kids, and they're all in the same congregation, and they've been worshiping together for 50 years but none of them can talk to each other about the fact that they have gay children. Um, I have friends who are called to ministry whose ordination boards hear their gifts and their graces until my friends tell them that they are gay or lesbian, and then they kick them out of the ordination process because of our church law. And I am blessed that I have many people who reach out to me and share with me their struggle of sexuality and faith. And I try to help these people choose both because I know God loves them and they know it too, but they go into our churches and they don't hear that love preached from our pulpits. Um, and so, um, you know, and I also recognize Brian and I are trying to grow 
our church in East Nashville, but a lot of our neighbors are gay or lesbian. Um, and when they learn our church's stance, they don't come to our church because they have other options. Um, we're the last mainline Protestant denomination um, who still have really what I view as harmful language in our book of discipline. Um, I'm also pregnant, and so this has become so much more important to me because I want my kid to be a United Methodist. I love this church. And we plan to baptize our kid in the United Methodist Church, but I've seen so many people who are baptized in our church, and then when people admit to the church who they are or try to bring their partner to church, our church turns its back. And so I just pray for all of you daily, and I just hope that when you are at General Conference, you will think about God's children and the humanity of each one of them, because I think I feel that our church has become very legalistic on this, and we forget to stop and breathe and listen to what God's children are telling us. And so I just urge you to vote in favor of inclusion. And I think that it will help our church not look hypocritical to the world, because at last general conference, we voted almost 50-50 that we don't disagree on this. And that's silly. Like, the church, the world sees that vote and they know that we obviously disagree. And so I just hope that we can share in communion and love one another um, and just hopefully learn to live into that tension of not knowing the answer, but knowing that we are called to love and serve our God. Because um, I think there are a lot more people than we realize who are affected by this because they're so quiet, they're parents, and they're scared to say anything. So thank you. thank you. I don't know if you all have any questions. It, I thought it was a listening session, so I didn't really come with a question because I don't want to put you all on the spot. Um, but I'm open to any questions or concerns that you have. I would simply like to say thank you for sharing that position today. One of the things that I'm intrigued by, but not sure yet, what this will look like is at General Conference, I, it's my understanding that there will be a time for us to have some holy conversation mm -hmm. around this issue. Yes. And I think it's very important that we hear um, a number of voices, and mm -hmm. especially those voices that often are not heard and don't feel comfortable speaking up. So thank you. And John Wesley says, you know, my favorite John Wesley quote, though we might not think alike, can we not love alike? And you know, like none of us have all of the answers. We're always moving on to perfection. And I just hope that we can really build a church where everyone feels welcome in the doors. So thank you. Don't go away. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your passion. Um, it's greatly appreciated, I think, heard this morning. Interesting, as we continue to look at segmentations of our church, and the differentiation in how we're able to speak for it or against it, when we haven't done a good job, even with the issue around race. Mm -hmm. So I'm not surprised, Laura, my, my right. heart is open for mm -hmm. God to move, but I'm not surprised around any issues when we haven't dealt with the race issue. Yep. And so we're moving into other areas when I think God is saying, you haven't dealt with the issue of race in this denomination. And we when, when you deal with that, it's amazing what will happen. Mm -hmm. And we haven't, but yet we'll have these tendencies to jump on individual items based on preference mm -hmm. versus based on who God is mm -hmm. in and through us. Yeah. So thank you again. Um, I just want to give a perspective around, uh, we have this tendency to hop around issues and there's one much greater than this one that we must deal with and we haven't. Mm -hmm. So I'll continue to pray for that one and the larger one mm -hmm. as I do every day of my life. Yeah. Well, and, and that's one thing, you know, I didn't grow up in the church um, and came to faith in middle school. And so sometimes I get a little confused about church things 
you know, but I think sometimes, you know, I'm also the chair of the sexual ethics committee for the Tennessee conference. Um, and so one of the things we're going to start doing is listening sessions, because I think we don't, and chances for dialogue. And, you know, and I think so much of this, I mean, I don't think we've fully dealt with women in ministry in our church, because goodness gracious, I have heard some things that have shocked me, you know, and so really trying to see how do we model being the church because i think we can be such a gift to the world if we show them look we can disagree but we love each other you know and so you know i would love to pick your brain on thoughts of how we could do that because i think issues of sexuality and race and um sexism i think so much of this goes so hand in hand you know um and so I, i'm hoping we can figure out models from other conferences to really utilize here to really have dialogue because i think it's so important so thank you for that stephen thank you laura um we're gonna take a email question now so sort of mix it up with our uh here in the studio audience what you got here we have a question from matt kelly who called in, who wrote in wanting to know do you think that if as proposed the guarantee of appointment for elders is ended the power of bishops to appoint should also be changed in some way so if the guarantee of appointment for elders is ended should the power of bishops to appoint be changed in some way i hadn't heard from that end of the table <laughs> <laughs> You wimps. That's why you're head of the delegation. I don't think so. <laughs> um, for some of you who've been in your in my office, I have a little name tag and it has J. H. Allen, who is my grandfather and uh, he was a delegate to the 1939 Uniting Conference from the Protestant Episcopal Church, and they didn't have no bishops and seemed to do okay. Now, having said that, the system we have seems to do okay also. Uh, and our bishops and DSs, I think, uh, work very hard and do their best with good and fair and appropriate appointments, not only for elders, but for local pastors and supply and part-time local pastors. Um, as many of you know, something in the Tennessee conference that we're going to be looking at at annual conference is whether or not to fiddle with our apportionment system and change the way churches pay for pastors' benefits. And I throw that only to say that if we, if we adopt some of the versions of that, it would uh, make it more expensive for medium-sized churches to have full-time clergy and less expensive for the small and the large churches. So when you get into any kind of, uh, it, the details aren't important other than to say it'll require changes, and I really would like to know that there's a group of people who really know our churches and really know our clergy well, uh, and we don't, I would hate to see us ever go to a call system like some of our brothers and sisters and other denominations. Absolutely. Let me have the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> that got him going. I finally got my nerve up. <laughs> Not really. Uh, Matt, I really would like to hear your opinion and your uh, advice on that particular issue. And you uh, can get that. Uh, you can send that to us through uh, our delegation head. The superintendency committee actually has petitions uh, that bring up that issue along with the uh, elders and um, term limits. And I think uh, based on what I'm hearing that there is, uh, that we're searching for the answers to that. And so we need your guidance and the guidance of other people that we represent. It's not what I have on my heart that is important. It, I speak for the 114,000 lay persons that elected me, and I'm going to listen to what they have to say. We have had a number of questions come in 
regarding restructuring proposal and the two alternate proposals. Um, and many of these want to know specifically where we stand on this issue. I, I don't want to um, not answer directly. And yet, as my colleague Jim Allen put in an email, this is still a moving target, as I understand it. I think what everyone agrees upon is what I heard Eddie Fox say, that change will happen. We just don't know what it's going to look like yet. So my personal comment and request to everyone present and anyone listening would be that you really do take seriously the covenant that we have to be the body of Christ together and that you pray for this delegation but for all delegates because there are such momentous decisions before us and we really want to hear from the Holy Spirit and to be quite wise in how we proceed. I don't know, we, we may have someone who would like to address restructuring. I thought we might, so Don Ladd. Again, uh, that's a moving target and I don't think any of us have the answers yet. The call to action is a very strong call to our church. And there is a screaming need for change. Now how that change uh, looks, I'm not sure yet. There are basically three plans that have are uh, in the process of being perfected. One is the MFA, uh, MFSA plan, which uh, deals very strongly with diversity, but also does not quite make the changes that I think most of the delegation will ask for. The IOT plan uh, is a very good plan. I think you'll find, though, that there is a lot of people that are concerned about a small group of people running our church and running our finances and making all the decisions of the church and taking away the ability of the laity and the clergy. Time me, because as a result of that, there is a plan B that is being worked on. In fact, uh, I am a part of that plan B and I don't want to uh, uh, voice my personal concerns or or I, I just you need to know that I am and I just got back from Atlanta I've spent three days uh, working with groups from all over the world to uh, perfect that plan and as quick as we can get it it will be on the website so all of you can read the big mistake, and uh, I apologize, in fact, uh, that is in print. Someone made the error of not identifying who the authors of Plan B were, and shame on some of us for that. Uh, and there's still a lot of other people working on Plan B that will make those changes. But if you want an education on Plan B, you go to umcplanb.org. There's all kinds of things there for it. If you want to educate yourself on the IOT plan, go to umc.org and plug in IOT plan. And you can see the comparison of the two and provide feedback because I don't think either one of the plans are perfect. I believe we're called to love each other and take the best of what is available and Hopefully, the Holy Spirit will move through the conference and we'll come out of the conference with a change that will blow, blow a breeze back to where the local church can take up the banner of winning souls for Jesus Christ. That's what I believe we're called to do. I just want to follow up on what Don said. Um, when the first plan was presented and the discussions began, um, I heard a lot of uh, 
early conversations about, I don't like this part of it. I don't like a set-aside bishop, so I vote no on this plan. I don't think 15 is the right number of people to govern us, so I vote no on this plan. And, and what's becoming more apparent to me, and this will be my first uh, general conference as a delegate, is that um, we have to change and we have to be nimble. And so it becomes our responsibility to seek guidance from God about what is right and then to try to offer guidance around some kind of compromise. It is not enough to just say, I don't like your plan, let's go home. Uh, we've got to figure out details that will work and that all of us can come together about. And I'm um, grateful that already groups are working hard to do that. Uh, each new plan that comes out is 65 or 70 or 100 pages, and it takes a long time to digest and, and figure out the differences. And that's, So I think it'll be a moving target for a long time. But my commitment is that I'm going to study everyone carefully and that as I understand what the different important issues are, that I'll, uh, in, in prayer, will begin trying to figure out where I think the middle ground is so that that at the appropriate time we can all participate in the discussion so that the committee, as it perfects it, can have the benefit of what we think because we don't have the luxury, in my view, of just voting no and going home for four years. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got to figure out a better system that will work better for all of us. And I'll add mine to both Don and Connie. Uh, I think we had to be careful not to make up our mind. Uh, because it would be very easy for us to, to say, based on the information we have now, I'm going to go this way and then close our mind uh, to the rest of it. And that seems to be a, a very living, moving of the spirit, and, and the wind blows where the wind blows. And, and I think we have to be careful not to, not to make up our mind too quickly. The one thing I'm committed to, uh, and I think this is what both Connie and, and Don said, the one thing I'm committed to is not not being comfortable with leaving Tampa doing nothing. Amen. Uh, we may not be able to, to, to correct all the issues before us in one general conference, but at least we can begin that process. And that's, that's what I'm seeking to do is to understand best I can all the various uh, nuances of all the plans because they all agree in some areas and disagree in other areas. And so somewhere in the midst of all of that, I think, is where God is leading us. And the, the, the challenge to us is is to be open to hearing what that is, where it may not necessarily be what I particularly would want, uh, but, it, but it's where God would have us be. And I think that's what we as a delegation and as a general conference have to be open to, to hearing as the, the leading of the Spirit. A pet peeve of mine has been church speak, and we're awful about using acronyms and using uh, code words for various things, and call to action, for example, has been a code word. Uh, but the original call to action plan, in, in my mind, had two big parts, and, and, and there's a question coming here, so I just want to warn my five, five uh, uh, others up here. Um, the original plan had, to, in my mind, two big parts. One part, the main part, was about making more vital congregations and developing uh, quality, efficient leadership in our church. And so far as I know, no one is opposed to that. And I don't think there's been any plan that said, there may be something that said, this may be a better way to do it or that's a better way to do it. But everybody's in total agreement in those concepts. Uh, our challenge is not to make that just be some more empty words with code words in it as we are, have been known to do in the United Methodist Church in the past, but really turn them in, into real work to bring disciples to Christ. The other half of the original plan, though, is, is really what most of the, um, not, not to put words in your mouth, but I think most of the concerns among the, the, the different options are, which is do we bring all the general agencies at the general church level Together, do we bring some of them together? Do we leave them all separate? Part one and part two, is there a bishop who is set aside from uh, being in charge of an Episcopal area so that that person can be uh, a full-time uh, spokesperson, if you will, for the Council of Bishops? Some, some people refer to it as Methodist Pope. That's probably 
uh, very unfair, but uh, nonetheless, that's, that's a code word that's been used there. So now coming to a question, is there, uh, as you've looked at the various plans, in, in, in the more important issue is making disciples of Jesus Christ and bringing to the church. Uh, what, what have any of you seen in any of the plans that you've worked on or looked at that'll help us do that? I'm sorry, those are code words. <laughs> okay. the, 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 the question was to, to explain that the initials that we were throwing around. Um, the initial plan was developed, we'll say it started in the Council of Bishops, and then they started working with the Connectional Table. And they put together a plan, and it was called the Call to Action, which has long since been dropped in favor of CTA. Uh, <laughs> initials, but it's call to action. And then after they looked at it and said, yes, we're in favor of uh, better leadership and vital churches, we need to put some meat on the bones. So they, those two groups put together a smaller group, said, all right, develop some legislation. And that group had the name of the Interim Operations Team, or IOT. So now this whole thing has gone to CTA slash IOT. Uh, yeah, the subway system, very, very, very. So, so uh, my apologies for doing just what I've, I've criticized others for doing, which is using initials and acronyms without explaining them. The, the other ones, uh, there was reference to MFSA, which is, which is a group, and it's the Methodist uh, Federation for Social Action. That group of people, they submitted an alternate plan. Another group of people, which included uh, some people, a number from the southeast, created another plan. They just called Plan B, you know, as Plan B being a, a reference. UMC Plan B. UMC Plan B. And, uh, and, and I'm sure there are many other options floating around that don't even have names yet. But... The question was, could we tell what, what uh, legislative committees that, that uh, we have, uh, will be serving on? I'm serving on discipleship. I'm on financial administration. Higher education and ministry. Faith and order. Local church. General administration. Let me add. Let me add one more. Um, Jim articulated three, and I don't know within that three, there is one more that has surfaced um, out of a group of, I think, clergy that is being had, and language I've seen is Adam Hamilton out of Churches of Resurrection. And so I don't know any details other than I did get an email um, last week, so I just need to read through that. So they're really four. Um, they're not four, I'm sorry. As I understand it, Adam Hamilton is supporting the call to action. That's what that okay. email is. Thank you. I need to read it. But I bet there are others. <laughs> uh, actually, as I understand, as I actually as I understand it, uh, Adam Hamilton uh, and is is on is a part of the IOT. But what but what Adam Hamilton has sent out is a letter that you can endorse. I think anybody that wants to that's calling for change in the church that is actually the issue that Adam Hamilton is bringing to the table uh, while I have the microphone if the, all, any of you are interested in information about the call to action report uh, this is a very good piece of literature that was put out by the Council on Bishops and uh, I'll have it available but it's also available at Cokesbury and it'll give you some great ideas uh, about what the thinking is of the forward movement of our United Methodist denomination and and so it does appear that I'm talking out of both sides of my mouth <laughs> I'm one of the endorsers of the Adam Hamilton that he sent out, mm -hmm. and yet I just said I think we need to be open to to all that. And and as I read that, 
and Harriet, and I'm going to go back and reread it. But, but as I read that, Adam Hamilton was saying, and this group was saying, there are many things in the IOT that, that are worthy and should be considered, but that may not be the direction we need to go. And what we as, as a general conference need to be is to be open to looking at all the plans. Right. And so if plan B is not what we need, and if the IOT is not what we need, and if, and if the yeah. MF you know, is not the one. So, so that's what I said earlier. There, there are good pieces in all of them. And what we have to do is to be open not to leave Tampa by doing nothing. And so I signed on, on – there was a place you could sign, and those of you who know me know I don't just willy-nilly sign everything. Uh, and so I signed that because as I, as I read it, there were people on theological spectrums across the board. In fact, when I looked to see who had signed it, I thought that's, that's amazing that, that any document that that many people with that many persuasions would sign. Um, and so I, I, I signed it. Because what I heard was there was a call to us as a general conference to, to truly be open to the leading of the Spirit and to make a decision that is going to take seriously uh, what can become a catchphrase and kind of a soundbite, but to take seriously making disciples uh, for the transformation of the world. And that's what should be guiding us as a general conference. That's what should be guiding us uh, as, a, as a denomination. So that, that's why. So it was not both sides of my mouth. And, and to uh, what everybody has been saying, there are still groups meeting, mm -hmm. uh, and I think those numbers are increasing. I've become part of a telephone group that's been meeting, and, and it's lay and clergy. Primarily, it started with people in the southeastern part of the country, not all southeast jurisdiction. There are also a lot of Texas people. There are now a growing number of Oklahoma people. And it's sort of, as the conversations have gone on, people are invited to add others. And from time to time, folks like Adam Hamilton have been on that conversation, people like Neil Alexander, who's the chair of the IOT, have been on that conversation. Because those who are listening and believe we all have to listen to God know that the plan, whatever it's going to be, can be perfected. And the more people's voices that are heard, the more likely it is we can do that. And so I think uh, people of good faith are reaching out and, and trying to include others in the conversation. I don't know that that will result in five more pure plans being presented, but the conversation around the key issues uh, to seek uh, compromise is good, I think. I would agree with that and would say that Really, I just wanted to make the point that Adam Hamilton didn't have a fourth plan, right, yeah, yeah. But, but that it is an openness to change and that he did address some of the pieces of the call to action saying that I know that these are concerns, but yes, let us be open. If, if I may shift, because we're going to have a lot of discussion about that, I would like to make sure that this word from uh, Tom Herring with local pastors is heard, and I'm going to take the liberty of reading a bit of what is present in the uh, ministry study and then Tom's concerns. Specifically under section 8 of the ministry study entitled Sacramental Authority, the sacraments are gifts to the church, symbols representing the presence of God in Christ for the transformation of the world through the grace of God. Since the beginning of the United Methodist Church, sacramental authority has been lodged in the order of elders. This is consistent with other denominations and signifies both the presidency of Christ at the sacrament and the connection between the local congregation, the denomination, and the ecumenical community. Sacramental authority is rooted in the whole body of Christ and in United Methodism is passed on through the Episcopal office and ordination. In the case of extraordinary missional need and where collaborative ministry among elders, deacons, and local pastors is restricted, the bishop may grant sacramental authority to local pastors and deacons. See paragraph 316, section 1, and paragraph 328 in the 2008 Book of Discipline for Explanation of Missional Need for Local Pastors and Deacons, respectively. We are seeking to order the sacramental life of the church in ways that are faithful, missional, clear, flexible, and collegial. And Tom writes, 
As a local pastor in this conference for 18 years, I have seen the conference transform toward a greater understanding of the holistic ministries of clergy and laity. Clergy associate members and local pastor voices need to be heard by our delegates if they are to have a clearer view of their conference. The statistics are extremely important. 47% of our churches are served by associate members and local pastors. Therefore, legislation that would limit these committed clergy would severely hinder the ministry of these people called and their churches. Statistically, these churches are showing greater growth, spiritual formation, and professions of faith. This is possible mainly because of the one-on-one -on -one discipling and family developing bond. On a general conference level, the same applies. 28% of all the churches within the United States of America are pastored by these clergy. So simply wanted to lift that up and make sure that voice was heard. I believe our goal is to go to uh, about eight more minutes. So just to uh, let us everyone know where we are on a time clock. Having said that, any other comments on in response to, to from the audience or from the group to Tom's question? Comment. Having been a district superintendent in a former life, uh, the church would be in a much, much, um, well, let me say it another way. The church would be a much poorer church uh, if it were not for the ministry of, of local pastors. Mm -hmm. uh, they oftentimes serve in, in places that nobody else wants to serve uh, for a number of reasons. And, and they are persons no less committed to, to making disciples, to being faithful pastors uh, than our elders in, in, their, in their setting. And so I affirm, uh, absolutely affirm, that, uh, that the role of the local pastor needs to be both appreciated, it needs to be highlighted, and it needs to be celebrated uh, because they are some incredible leaders who provide enormous leadership in pastoral care uh, to people that because they're in a smaller membership church are no less children of God uh, and are no less deserving of the very best pastoral leadership that, that they can be afforded. The question is whether or not there's proposed legislation to reduce what local pastors can do. And as I understand it, and of course everything will be changed before it's, it's voted on, but there are concerns raised about where sacramental authority resides. And the study commission is proposing legislation that clarifies that the role of the elder is this, the role of the deacon is this, the role of the local pastor is this, that there are shared um, ministries, but there are also distinctives. And the concern from the local pastors would be that legislation would be presented and voted upon that would limit their ability to perform the sacraments. So. That's part of the ministry, the 2008 General Conference. The question is, who wants that to happen? The 2008 General Conference appointed a ministry study to look at ministry overall, and they have a 40-plus um, page report that is available on the General Board of Higher Education um, website. Perhaps something we should have started with instead of ending with is a quick explanation of, of how changes come to the Book of Discipline. The Book of Discipline is our book of church law. Every four years, a thousand people get, a committee of a thousand gets together in general conference and fiddles with it. And they can only fiddle with a paragraph in the discipline if someone, 
you, 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 me, send in a petition and say, I think paragraph one, two, three, four, five should be changed by adding this line or subtracting this line. So everything pretty much that we've talked about and have tried to, to learn from you has to do with someone somewhere thought it would be a good idea to make a change. Uh, and it always comes, okay, that's the phrase is that opens a paragraph. Once somebody makes a suggestion, then that opens it up for, for general conference to fiddle with it all they want. So someone can send in a resolution that says, I think paragraph one, two, three, four, five should not be changed. And that means that paragraph is now open and we can change it any way we want to. So as we respond to these questions, all we have is what's been printed and sent in, but recognizing that anything that's been proposed, and maybe a good uh, example would be the call to action plan. That was proposed. Well, that then, if you will, opens the door for alternate plans. So even though we can tell you what someone sent in, that may bear very little relationship to what comes out the other end. We are about out of time. Uh, Harriet, have you got, did we get to all the emails you received? Have you got another one? I don't have another one, but I would be very remiss if I didn't say a word of thanks to everyone who is present today, everyone who has called in or submitted emails to our delegation members who are here. And I would also be very remiss if I didn't say a thank you to United Methodist Communications and Harry Leak for allowing us to be present and to have this session recorded so that it will be available for others. And Kevin Sparkman with the Tennessee Conference Communications Office also deserves a very huge thank you for working to make this happen. I do want to add that if there are other comments or questions that anyone would like to address to the delegation, if you will go to tnumc.org, our conference website, you will be able to click on general conference delegates and you have all of our emails there. You can send a group email, you can send us individual emails, and as time permits, I will make that disclaimer, as time permits, we will respond, but I can assure you that we will read everything that is submitted and we will continue to be in prayer, and I will continue to ask you to be in prayer for us. So. Amen. Amen. Thank you again. We're going to call it a day. <laughs>